Hi, I'm Carl Kuhn, Senior Video Application Engineer with Tektronix. I'm here today to talk about Precision Time Protocol and how it will eventually replace Blackburst and Tri-Level Sync as we move into the world of IP. We're merging together the world of IT and broadcast. So video engineers will become IT engineers. IT engineers will need to become video engineers. Video engineers live in the world now of SDI, analog signals, and audio. Blackburst and Tri-Level is how they synchronize their systems. The importance is on delivering signal quality. QoS is how we test. Quality of service is the focus. The challenge is to understand IT technology. The IT engineers, they live in the world of IP flow, protocols, network traffic, and configurations. Their timing is network time protocol and precision time protocol. Their signal is less sensitive to the impact of bit errors. Data can be reset. This is not the case with video. Quality of experience is their methodology in testing. The challenge is to understand video technology. But they all need tools for reporting, monitoring, and analyzing quality of service and quality of experience in hybrid facilities. Network time protocol is a software implementation. It's not accurate enough to replace Blackburst and Tri-Level as your house reference. I look at it like SMPTE time timecode. For television, we need to get more accurate. The challenge of NTP is synchronizing over a network as far as UDP might be using port 123. You have to make sure that your firewall allows this traffic, or the firewall might see it as a network attack. The hierarchy is stratum 0, 1, and 2, where 0 is your GPS, an atomic clock reference, highly accurate. Then stratum 1 is the world that we typically live in, where we're connecting a signal generator to a stratum 0 device, usually through GPS. Stratum 2 is the computer or client attached to a stratum 1 clock. PTP basics. It's a hardware implementation. It's been used for years as far as mobile phones for the handoffs. Also will be used for ATSC 3.0. The Grand Master periodically transmit sync messages to the network. The slaves use these sync messages to derive their time. Delay in IP networks is both variable and asymmetrical. So it's basically different in both directions. It's not consistent, it's not the same. The slave device must periodically send a delay message to the Grand Master to make sure that's still in time. The Grand Master timestamps the receipt of the delay message and then sends back a delay response message. Then the slave can make a determination how to adjust its clock to meet the system. PTP in pictures. We have a master clock and a slave. The master sends out two packets to get things started, a sync message and a sync follow-up. The slave clock looks at that, enters its own timestamp, and sends a request back to the master clock. The master clock looks at the time that was inserted by the slave and then comes up with another packet, a delay response message that is sent back to the slave so the slave knows the network latency in both directions and adjusts its internal clock accordingly. Some terms and definitions. PTP domain, a logical grouping of clocks that are synchronized to each other but they may not be synchronized to clocks in another domain. You can have separate domains on separate time bases. A grandmaster clock is an ultimate source. This is what is usually synchronized to GPS or GLONASS or possibly both. A master clock is what is synchronizing the other clocks in that domain. A slave is synchronized to another clock. 
relevant standards, we have IEEE 1588. This is kind of the high level overview of precision time protocol. The video implementation is 2059, 2059-1 and 2059-2. Dash Dash one is about generation and alignment. Dash two is about the protocol specific to different flavors of video timing that we need. For audio implementations, AES 67 is used. SIMPTI 2059-1. This is where you're getting to the epoch, the birth moment in time of where PTP starts. It's January 1st, 1970 at 0, 0,100 hours. What it's really doing, the Dash 1, provides alignment points for all the other flavors of audio and video timing that we need in this industry. Dash 2 gets a little bit deeper. We're talking about the best master clock algorithm, the BMCA, which is how the network determines which clock is the master that all other clocks defer to and time to. PTP profiles are designed so a slave should be synchronized within five seconds of actually connecting to the network. That's an important aspect. The accuracy of the network needs to be within one microsecond. There is synchronization of metadata so all devices know how long the signal took between point A and point B in the return path. PTP message types. Announce. This establishes the synchronization hierarchy. Determine which clock becomes the grandmaster. Sync and follow up is how the slaves determine their time from what is being sent from the grandmaster. Delay response. It is how the grandmaster determines the propagation delay between the slave and the grandmaster. The delay response is sent from the grandmaster to the slave so it can adjust its own internal time base to be timed to the remainder of the system. The best master clock algorithm, BMCA, is all about determining which clock is the most accurate and which clock would be secondary to the most accurate in case it's needed to take over if there's a loss of GPS lock, become disconnected from the network, or the Grandmaster is unable to perform its duties. The BMCA runs on all clocks within the network because all clocks should be able to step in if they're needed to take over as the Grandmaster. BMCA, list of criteria, how is determined which clock is the best master clock. Priority one, field, the lowest number below 128 wins. So you can configure that within the device itself to force that to be the grandmaster. Two, class of the clock. Is it GPS or free running? GPS always wins. Clock accuracy. How stable is the clock of the device? Clock variance. Jitter and wander of the clock. And if all those are equal, then it drops down to priority two, which the lowest value below 128 wins. You can configure that priority one, priority two, and in what case, which one would step in to take over. A tiebreaker, which you would try to avoid, is by looking at the Ethernet MAC address of the hardware connected to the network. Main and backup grandmaster failover. So you have your primary unit, you need backup clocks that are ready to step in in case they're needed. So you want redundant grandmasters. You have a main grandmaster and a backup grandmaster. You can see how the priority field two is 127, which means it would have priority over numbers that are higher than that. So if both identical masters are locked to GPS, they will have the same clock. If both identical masters are locked to GPS, they will have the same clock quality. So the lowest priority two field will become Grandmaster. If the main clock loses GPS lock, then the backup becomes the better master and will take over as the Grandmaster. Here we have a block diagram to show the flow of your best master clock algorithm. The unit there on the top right 
drops to priority one at 127, which is the lowest number of the other priority ones within the network. So it says, I am the best grandmaster. So you can see how the flow then would go to all the other devices that become the slave to that grandmaster. The system is powered on, the devices listen to gather and announce messages, and they use the best master clock algorithm to determine grandmaster. When the system is powered on, all the devices listen to gather the announce messages. Then they determine who is the best grandmaster. You have ordinary clocks. Essentially, these are devices that are not a switch or a router. Other clocks that could be a slave, could be a master, or they could be either one. But it's not a switch or a router. Type 2, we have transparent and boundary clocks. Transparent clock accounts for queuing delays in switches and routers, because all switches and routers have queuing delays. And this is where it's very important to have in, a, in your network, all your devices are PTP aware. If a device is PTP aware, it will take into account delays. If it's not, it's creating a delay that's not being accounted for in the network and that will eventually create a challenge in keeping a stable network. So you're doing hardware timestamps. That's really the magic rocket science here at PTP. It's a hardware implementation where NTP is a software implementation. So you have a correction field in your message header that adjusts all the time bases of the slaves to equal what is being sent from your master clock. A boundary clock would be if you have more than one domain where it crosses from one domain group to another, the boundary clock crosses the boundary from domain one, for example, to domain two. And that removes any queuing, any delays in the network to adjust for that. Once again, the boundary clock is between different domains. Domain one, domain two. That is the boundary between the two domains so it's actually acting as a slave to the grandmaster, but it would be a master to the slaves in its own domain. The point here to make, once again, all routers and switches must be PTP aware. Either transparent clock or a boundary clock. They must be able to recognize and handle timestamp in, timestamp out, and account for the latency within the device. Our flow here, we can see what we just talked about. We have a grand master in domain one and a boundary clock crossing over from domain one into domain two, where we have our transparent clocks, router for example, going out to our slaves. An ordinary clock for a camera, or it could be an ordinary clock if you're using AES 67 for an audio component. So how do I synchronize in a hybrid facility? The SPG-8000A is designed for doing SDI, analog black burst, tri-level sync, and also to be a PTP grandmaster. It provides two optional PTP network ports, one RJ45, one SFP. By being an option, it allows you to be future-proof. That way, when you actually need PTP, you could upgrade, software key upgrade. Once again, one IP address with two separate domains. It can support an input reference, GPS, GLONASS, the Russian version of GPS, analog black burst tri-level, and also can take PTP as an input. Then the outputs, SDI, black burst tri-level, all synchronize off the PTP grandmaster output. So all the outputs will be synchronized to a central clock. So you can act as a PTP grandmaster or a slave. Stay Genlock is an important feature of the Tektronix unit that if you would lose GPS or your house reference, Blackbird's coming into it, you'd be free running. But the ovenized oscillator of the SPG is very stable. When you reacquire the external reference with GPS or Blackburst, it would not create any sync shock. It would be a slow slewing back to time correlate with the 
external clock coming in. That way there's no ripple through your facility from sink shock. The SPG-8000A is an all-in-one SDI and IP generator. It has master sync generation capabilities for multiple reference outputs, also multiple timecode outputs. Option PTP allows you to be future-proof and do a software-only field upgrade when you have the facility need for precision time protocol. Option GPS also includes GLONASS, which you can use for your, uh, your reference. Option 3G HD SDI, signal generation, and also Dolby E support. Option AES includes audio tones and DAR outputs. The optional backup power supply is load tested daily. Highly recommend getting that for a highly reliable network. The load test is done once a day to see the health of the secondary power supply. Also, Tektronix has a patented algorithm for determining the usage, the load on a power supply, and also the operational temperature as far as aging. So you can see the age, the wear and tear on a power supply. It has configuration capabilities for web-based interface and remote management with SNMP. The output spigots, the black burst outputs, and HD tri-level sync gives you three. You can get option BG to add two more. They can be uh, black burst, gen lock input, passive loop through because that way you can reference to an external tri-level or black burst. Linear time code LTC, four outputs, or three outputs and one input, depends how you have it configured. The GPS option, highly recommended. Hot swappable power supplies, good to have. That way you have your dependability for primary and secondary power supply. Precision time protocol, option PTP, to future proof yourself. It comes with the hardware already installed, the RJ45 and the optical SFP. And when the time is right, you can upgrade with a software key. The SDI test signals include Dolby E audio test signals, two channels and two outputs for each, composite analog, NTSC and PAL test signals, where you can add uh, option BG and get two more outputs, word clock, your 48 kilohertz clock reference, AES audio, option AG, where you have four pairs or one pair of DAR, option AG, brings in AES audio, where you can have four pairs of tone or one pair of DARS. It includes NTP server and SNMP and Ethernet capabilities. In summary, IP offers both opportunities and challenges to the industry as we make this migration from the world of SDI to the world of IP. It is necessary to gain a basic understanding of IP to be successful you really need to focus on understanding how to configure. Standards are developing for lightly compressed video over IP, which will be driven by 4K, UHD, and high frame rate deployments. PTP will be used for uh, live production workflows. The transition to IP will be gradual, and hybrid SDI workflows will exist for the foreseeable future. Thank you very much for your time and hopefully this video was of value to you as you learn about our transition to the world of IP. I'd also like to thank the folks at Photronic in Melrose, Massachusetts for producing and making this video available.